Okay, good afternoon. We're going to start now after some little technical delays. Welcome to the third EMI workshop. And first of all, some announcements. If you are one of those persons who has missed a previous required workshop for uh, legitimate excuses, uh, some of you have had proper excuses, let me know. Is anyone here needing the first? Let me ask again. Does anyone need a makeup of the first workshop? Okay, guess not. Well then, guess we won't. Uh, some of you have not turned in the schedule forms for the micro teaching workshop because of the demand, the increased demand was a little more than expected, and also we had to change the schedule a bit. So they, the office emailed you earlier about uh, the micro teaching workshops and a few of you still have not responded. So you can fill out the form back there before you leave if you've not indicated the times you want to do a micro-teaching workshop. That's for people who are going for the certificate. If you're not doing the certificate, you don't have to worry. <clears throat> okay. Can you all hear me back there? Yeah, I just did a tick on before this, so my, my voice may be a bit tired. <clears throat> okay, so. Last time, we talked a bit about academic writing. Today, we're going to focus more on presentation skills, and uh, more so academic presentations for, this could be for presentations you might do in your graduate courses. Uh, this could be for conference presentations, as well as future teaching. And many of you probably will be teaching in some capacity, or perhaps maybe training people, if not teaching in some kind of a supervisory role. So we're going to look at different aspects of English lecture skills, lecture expressions and strategies. That includes things like how to do an introduction, how to start a lecture, things like the organization structure and flow of a lecture, things like transitional expressions. And we're going to look at a couple of video clips of university lectures to see how this works. And we're going to critique them in terms of organization, structure, flow, transitional expressions, as well as audience interaction, delivery, the delivery of the lecture, delivery technique, and uh, things like how they use questions, how they use transitions. And so we're going to critique these so that you can get a better idea of how to lecture, how to come across as a professional lecturer, how to come across as a good presenter at a conference, how to come across as a good teacher when you're teaching in the classroom. So, <clears throat> we will first talk about introductions. So, when you do an introduction to a lecture, what are things that you do in an introduction? When you start a lecture, or you start a conference presentation, how do you do introductions? What do you start with? A story. Okay, maybe a story. Sometimes a story. Now, are stories common in, say, a lecture on engineering or a conference presentation. It, it, it depends. Uh, probably more commonly in humanities and social sciences it might be more appropriate to have a story that's relevant. Okay. What else do you put in an introduction? Okay. Okay, so kind of an overview or an outline of what we're going to talk about. Do you remember my introduction? I said what we're going to talk about, right? I gave you an outline, an overview of the things we're going to talk about. What else do you put in an introduction? Interesting or complicated related to the Okay. So sometimes maybe uh, something that's going to be a sort of lead-in, like a hot topic. So maybe you're giving a physics lecture on quantum physics, and a great lead-in would be, well, this recent uh, controversy over faster-than-light neutrinos. Uh, have you heard this news? If you've paid any attention to any science news in the past four months, you must know what I'm talking about, right? These faster-than-light neutrinos. 
a subatomic particle, particle called a neutrino. And there were some experiment, experiments at CERN, uh, the research facility in Switzerland, that provided possible evidence for neutrinos that could, they thought, go faster than light. And just recently, a few weeks ago, they, just, they realized, oh, we made a mistake. Never mind. Everything's okay now. Uh, but this is a big story. So if you're talking about quantum physics, the big neutrino incident, something that's interesting. And this is a sort of lead-in. And uh, uh, another way of maybe calling a lead-in might be uh, a segue. This is actually a word originally from French. It's basically transition. The word segue, or it's also the spelling has been kind of anglicized uh, like that. <clears throat> In other words, a transition. A segue can be the introductory transition leading into the, the beginning of a lecture. And some segue also refers to transition between sections of a lecture. Uh, but in the beginning of a lecture, some kind of an interesting segue or lead in, like a story or a hot topic that's a hot issue that's related to the topic of the lecture. What else could be an introduction? Yes, rationale. Okay, rationale. Did I give you a rationale at the beginning of my talk? I explained, well, these are things to know so that you can be effective lecturers. So you can uh, give authoritative quality lectures and such. So a rationale. So it helps to give a rationale, especially if it's a class lecture. So things like a rationale, an overview, an outline, maybe an interesting segue or lead in. Can you think of anything else? Introduce myself. No. Yeah, self-introduction. Well, let's assume the students already know you mm -hmm. after you've done that. Uh, if it's a conference presentation, probably don't, at least in most fields, you don't do self-introductions. In conferences, they care more about the facts rather than the person. If it's the first day of class, then self-introduction and such. Uh, another thing you might do is background. Uh, the background of the topic. Say if you're giving a conference presentation and you're presenting on a specific research finding, well you might start with the research background. In previous studies found such and such and it made such a, such a claim. Uh, another kind of uh, transition might be a bridge or a connection with the previous lecture. So mention the previous lecture, what you talked about last time, and then connect it with today's lecture. Did I do that? Yeah, I kind of did at the beginning. I reminded you of what I talked about last time and made a connection with what I'm talking about today. So these are some typical components of an introduction. Your introduction might not have all of these, but probably the most important, say for a classroom lecture, would be a rationale because students might want to know why are we learning this uh, and then an overview. Uh, and it also really helps to start with a, a kind of a bridge with the last thing you talked about the last time before. <clears throat> when I was a, a freshman in college, I took a biology class for my requirements, the required subjects. And I had a biology teacher who often lectured from his notes. Sometimes he would forget where he finished last time. He, he would often point to one of the students and said, what was the last thing I said last time? One day he pointed to me, what was the last thing I said? And I said, goodbye. <laughs> so when you're, when you're lecturing, uh, teaching a course, take notes of where you left off so students will know you're not an absent-minded professor or an absent-minded teacher. <clears throat> so my own, I guess, clownishness taught me later as a professor to make a note of where I finish in my lecture notes or in a textbook. So those are introductions. And from introductions, then you need to go into the body of the talk. And then you often <coughs> give kind of, so you often give an outline, especially a, a somewhat detailed outline, maybe, maybe one minute, maybe two minutes, 
kind of explain where you're going. <clears throat> and again, maybe three to five main points. Again, because of the working memory, people have a working memory of about five things they can hold in their head. So if you give them, say, an outline, an overview of three to five points, like today we're talking about X because rationale. And in order to talk about X, we need to look at A, B, and C, and D. And maybe briefly explain what A, B, C, and D are. And that can be part of your introduction. And then make a, a kind of a segue into the main uh, body of your talk. And let's get started. Now we're going to move on to the first point, something like that. On the website, there is a handout of lecture expressions and transitional expressions. I think it's about 18 pages. There's a lot there you can look at. Is it 12 pages or 18 pages? I can't remember. Anyway, there is a, there is a separate handout on the website of lecture expressions. Anyway, make a transition or a segue into the body and then uh, into the body, the first main topic of your lecture. And then when you've covered the first main topic, have another transition. Okay, we've talked about A, now let's move on to B. Or if you've talked about A, now let's think about the implications of A for this, for B, and move into part B. So it helps to plan out some decent transitions. <clears throat> and last time we talked about, uh, when we were talking about writing, we were talking about an aspect of writing. We touched on this briefly. I didn't really give you this word last time, but it has to do with cohesion. Well, in writing as well as in speaking, <clears throat> you're referring to maybe an idea or something multiple times. And we talked last time how in writing this might vary from subject to subject. And I'm on page two of the handout on cohesion. I'm not going to really go through this, but it depends on the field uh, that you're in. It may depend on whether you're speaking or doing academic writing. Uh, sometimes you might repeat the same word over and over. And that's especially common in science writing or in speaking. Because if you're giving a science lecture and if you say it, it's not clear what it is referring to because you're talking, you've mentioned a lot of different nouns in your lecture or in your writing right before that. Uh, more commonly in humanities and social sciences, we might use synonyms or paraphrases, especially in, say, some humanities fields where your expression is really important and you really don't want to be redundant. <coughs> uh, sometimes we uh, uh, just repeat the same words, uh, like in science. But I'm not going to talk too much about cohesion. What I'm interested in is coherence. Cohesion has to do with um, the connection between words. If I say it, what does it refer to? If I say president, well, what does the president refer to? Am I referring to the president of the United States? Am I referring to the president of Hungary, the president of uh, Mexico? You know, which president? That's cohesion. When you use a noun or a pronoun, can the listeners understand what that's referring to? If I say he, who is he referring to? But what's more interesting, more important is coherence in writing and in speaking. Coherence is the logical connection between ideas, between sentences, between um, clauses, between phrases. Now you may be used to certain Korean expressions. I've got them on the handout on page three. <clears throat> For example, and this is just a few. I've got a lot more transitions in the handout that's on the website in English, English transitions. <coughs> How about took bill he, took he? Especially. Okay. Now, in Korean, do you use that a lot in lectures? Do lecturers and professors use that a lot? Okay, it's, it's for emphasis. So keep in mind it's for emphasis. And of course, maybe you don't want to overuse um, this. If you overuse this, it might, at least in English, it might sound too informal <coughs> if you use too much emphasis. It's kind of more conversational style. How about what? Kunde, Kurunde? What is that? By the way? Hmm? But, but, or by the way. 
But by the way, they seem kind of different. You start to see that sometimes there's a problem of equivalence. Uh, it really depends on the context how you translate some of these, like kurana, kratiman. Is that but or although or however? But however, yes. And later on, in a future lecture, we're going to get more into detail about some of these transitionals in academic writing in English. Like, what's the difference between but, although, however, and such. Uh, I'm not really sure what that means. So, so, is that more common in writing or speaking? Speaking? Okay. Uh, Okay, you know. Uh, un or nun, number seven. I'm, I'm going to skip to seven. Un or nun. How do you translate that? Hmm? Maybe, yes. It's a subject? Okay. How is it different from, say, e or ga on a noun? <laughs> Okay, you know the difference, but you can't explain it. And that's actually the same as articles in English, the or a. If you have, ask a native speaker, when you use the or a, well, they know how to use it, but they can't explain it. Uh, I believe that in Korean, un or nun sometimes has kind of a transitional effect a, for kind of marking the topic of the sentence, and maybe shifting topics, changing topics, or changing, maybe changing back to an old topic. Oh, and there's no equivalent in English, and maybe in English you have to use some, if you're changing topics, maybe, what do you use for changing topics in a lecture? What kind of transition do you use to change, if you want to introduce a new topic, maybe this is not for a new topic, but if you want to move to a new topic, maybe let's move on, or what else? Okay, on the other hand, okay. moreover, do you use moreover in spoken English these days? It's not really common anymore, especially in spoken English. Moreover is kind of very formal. We use it occasionally in writing, in formal writing, but not too much. Sometimes we begin a sentence with maybe now. Beginning a sentence, sometimes to shift to a new topic. And often, we shift to a new topic, maybe with an increased intonation at the beginning of a sentence. Later I'll play a lecture video and I want you to listen for some of these things. So if I start a sentence, now let's move on to blah blah blah. Notice the high, intona uh, high intonation at the beginning. Now, let's not move on to, we've talked about A and we've concluded that now let's move on to, or now let's look at, so notice the high intonation at the beginning of my sentence. Uh, and as well as sometimes words like now or let's move on. Or now let's move on to topic B. Things like that. Sometimes when you return to a previous topic, you need to come back to a previous topic, what word do you use? Hmm? Okay, maybe explicitly, now going back to previously, if you want to be formal or writing style, the aforementioned or um, as mentioned. Also, in more in, in lectures, it might be appropriate to use a more informal expression like uh, as for, as to, as regards, regarding, concerning. Those are all in the handout, don't worry. <coughs> Maybe you can think about some of these others at home. Uh, ita is kind of hard. Maybe there is, there are. And maybe that's okay sometimes for, for speaking. Probably it's hard to come up with a good equivalent for itta sometimes. I have seen, at least in writing, Koreans kind of translating something like kyongwe. What is that? Okay, in the case of. Okay, in the case of. Uh, does that work exactly the same in English? Is if you say in case of, uh, let's go like signs in public places, like in case of fire. You know, you see signs like on a fire extinguisher. In case of fire, um, 
break the glass, in other words, pull out the fire extinguisher, or pull the pin out of the fire extinguisher. So, you can, so in case of, in English, is a bit more like a conditional expression. Or sometimes, for an example, like in the case of, so for examples in a talk in the case of, I think we don't use in case of quite the same or as often as the kyonyue. Uh, because in case of with no v sounds like a conditional expression. In case of fire, if there is a fire, you know, call 119 or 911 in the US. What dunga? I think I've seen this in writing at least. Dunga? Evidence. I've seen Korean writers write as evidence in writing. That doesn't really work in English. Uh, <coughs> maybe, uh, but maybe in speaking as evidence or hmm? based on. Okay, based on sounds smoother. Yeah, based on the experiment by so and so, uh, and such. <coughs> what else? I've, in terms of maybe in terms of yeah. I have to speak up. To prove? As proof? I mean, yeah. Sometimes you might say as evidence is a prepositional expression, but uh, as proof, I don't know, I don't think we use really, sometimes maybe as evidence, but um, as an example or uh, in order to prove something or let's prove this or <coughs> and such. It, it, this just doesn't translate well into English somehow. And what about hoxi? That's very colloquial, perhaps. Is this, would you use this in a lecture? So I hear people, you know, on the street saying hoxi a lot, especially women. But would it be, I don't know, about, what about for a lecture or presentation? Would a speaker say hoxi? Probably not. But in English, at least informal English, you hear like a lot. People like to say like, you know, like in like every sentence. It has a certain an emphatic purpose uh, as well as a softener. This hoaxy kind of softens what you're saying. But at the same time in English, the like draws attention to new information. So you might hear younger speakers occasionally using like even in a formal, a semi-formal lecture which sounds strange. Now, the point is basically there are some of these transition expressions that are hard to translate from one language to another. And later on in a future seminar, we're going to look more in detail at transitional expressions in academic writing. And I'll give you some examples uh, and we'll have fun critiquing them. Another issue is disfluencies. When you're giving a lecture, sometimes you forget what you're going to say. So what's the best thing to do? If you're trying to give a lecture and you come to the middle of the sentence and you forget what you're going to say, or you have trouble thinking of the right expression, what do you do? Is it better to be quiet or to say, uh, uh, or to say, okay, well, or, or simply forget the sentence and move on? What's the best thing to do? <laughs> Pardon? Third? The third one, which was my third one. So, <laughs> see, I'm old and I forget. Okay or well? Perhaps. That may be better for a longer pause. So sometimes. Does it sound good when you say uh a lot or um? No. Too many good is not good. Aside from the fact that it might be annoying to listen to, what's wrong with a lot of uh and um? Oh, you mean as a strategy? Yeah. Okay, sometimes <laughs> if you forget what you're going to say, turn, make a, if you're really fast, uh, if you can think fast, yet come up with a question to give to students while you're thinking of what you were going to say. <coughs> ah and um, sometimes it's hard to avoid, but if you do it regularly or too much, it sounds like you're not prepared or you're nervous, or you're not confident. 
for younger or less experienced speakers, probably just takes practice. Maybe the first time you do a presentation, you're going to be nervous, you're not used to speaking, and you may do uh and um a lot and end up annoying the audience. <clears throat> Which is better, a silent pause where you're just silent or a filled pause? You fill that pause with an um or well. You prefer a filled pause with... Okay. You don't like silent pauses? If I'm giving them a question, then silent pause might be okay. But if I was saying something, and then I just pause and mm -hmm. they still in my way. Okay. Why is she? Okay. There's a difference in how you do silent pauses versus filled pauses. Again, a lot of, or even enough filled pauses with ah uh and um can get annoying. Silent pauses, it kind of depends. There's maybe two kinds of silent pauses. The first kind is like you're having a, a problem mentally. <laughs> you know, you're like uh, Grandpa Simpson or who, or my father. My father, he's getting old and some, for a while he's had this habit of simply stopping in the middle of a sentence and never finishing the sentence, uh, which gets really annoying. It's like somewhere there must be a graveyard for dead sentences that my father has killed. <clears throat> Poor sentences that never saw the light of day. So there's a difference between a, a silent pause that is awkward, where it looks like you're having a stroke or, or something, or maybe something wrong with the blood vessels up here. Uh, or there's a silent pause where you just pause and then you come to your main point. So notice I had a second pause there, one second pause. Now that can be effective, more effective than an um, because it gives you a second to think of what to say. What does it do for the listeners when you make a, a short pause and then you go on? It kind of gets your attention for a second, right? It gives you a chance to think and it gives your listeners a uh, chance to focus their attention. It makes them, especially if it's a significant point. So sometimes silent pauses are helpful. Sometimes you have trouble thinking of the right word, especially if it's a more technical word. Um, sometimes there are paraphrasing expressions. I've got those at the bottom of page three. Sometimes you need to kind of backtrack and repair. We, in linguistics, we say repair your conversation, what you're going to say. Or you can use these as pause fillers sometimes. I mean, uh, you know, as long as you don't do this too often, it sounds kind of unprofessional or slangy if you do it too often. I mean, uh, you know, uh, like, like, you know, that sounds like you're trying to be too cool. <clears throat> Another thing you can do on pa uh, page four, sometimes you have trouble finding the right words. And it can be helpful just to have in mind certain light expression certain light words. For example, you might have trouble thinking of the right verb to use in a lecture. Well, in lecturing, sometimes in a second language especially, as well as in the first language, thinking of the right specific verb might take a little longer than a so-called light verb. Light verbs are very high frequency, very common verbs. They're very basic in meaning, very little meaning. Like do or make. Sometimes instead of finding the right academic verb, just use do or make, or set or put. And there's some light verbs here. You wouldn't do this in academic writing, but in speaking, this can be a helpful way to, to think more quickly. Light verbs, other light expressions. Uh, I wouldn't want to encourage you to say thing all the time. Thing a lot gets kind of annoying. But sometimes these light expressions, especially the light verbs, can help you avoid the problem of getting stuck because you're trying to think of the right verb. So any questions? Yes, in the case of. So if you say in the case of, that's more appropriate for giving an example. 
and later on we'll talk about definite articles, I think, in a future seminar. In the case of would be appropriate for examples. If you say in case of, that's kind of like formal English for like signs and public notices, like in case of fire, call this number. That's, uh, that's something you see in public signs and notices, and it's kind of more like if, uh, a conditional expression. Other questions? Yes? Can you write the website you mentioned earlier? The, the you mentioned earlier for like expressions we can use for actions. Have you been to the, uh, the website for this seminar? Yes. Yes. So I've got uh, extra handouts on the seminar website for week three. One is a handout of lecture expressions. Some of you have that. And it's a list of different lecture expressions, transitional expressions, and other expressions. And I'll have a second handout on types of questions you can use in lectures, uh, question types and question examples. Other questions? Now, we haven't talked about questions. That's maybe one thing I'll briefly mention. What kind of questions are appropriate to ask your students? Something like an open question, not a closed question. A question that is, a question that has a very simple answer like yes, no. It's not interesting. It's not going to get students to talk or think. Or if it's a simple factual question, something that just involves repeating a fact from the book or a repeating a fact from my lecture. That's kind of boring. Uh, in teaching or linguistics, we call it a knowledge display question. I'm just asking you to display the knowledge that you should know. It's a knowledge display question. You, you want to avoid closed questions like yes, no, or knowledge display questions that are just repeating facts. You want to ask questions that are more interesting, that are going to make students think. Things like conceptual questions. Earlier. Conceptual questions, that's in the handout on questions. Conceptual questions about concepts, making them think about concepts. Application questions, again, this is all in the extra handout. Application questions where you make them apply what they've learned to something else. Okay, we've talked about X. How do you think X would apply to a situation like Y? And that makes you think. Okay, so how do you apply this knowledge to something new? So, an application question. Uh, questions that require students to analyze something, that require students to put things together in a new way, to think creatively. Those are the more interesting questions. Now, we're going to look at two lec one, maybe two lecture samples, depending on time. I'm going to play you maybe five minutes or three to five minutes of a lecture on evolution. It's a biology lecture. So. Uh, if you're a humanities person, don't worry. It will, hopefully, if we have time, listen to a couple of minutes from a humanities lecture on philosophy later on if we have time. But I want you to look at some of the things that are in the handout here. Organization. Is this lecture well organized? Does it seem to be well organized, good intro, good flow of ideas and information? How about his expressions? Are the expressions appropriate? Are there transitions? If you see hear any transition expressions, try to note those. <clears throat> any disfluencies, does he handle the disfluencies well when he has trouble thinking of what to say? What about the delivery? Is his voice delivery good? His lecture delivery, the delivery technique? And we'll talk more about delivery technique in a future workshop in more detail. Use of media, does he make use of PowerPoint appropriately? Appropriate use of technology or other uh, visual aids. So first we'll hear, okay, mouse is not working. Biology. We're going to talk about adaptive evolution. And that means that today is going to be all about the different kinds of natural selection. Can you hear this? I'm sorry, we don't have good uh, speakers. If you can't hear very well, at least look at what he's doing and his technique.
again and again. So this is just part of the intellectual toolkit for dealing with this report. This is an outline of the lecture, and uh, it's just a whole lecture, it's a pretty small type, and I don't expect you to read that off the board, but I do want you to have it so it makes it easy for you to read through this when you download it and look at it. You know. Because it does summarize the main Basically, what I'm going to do is tell you that evolution can be either adaptive, in which case it has been driven by and shaped by natural selection. It can be neutral, in which case it's been dominated by grit, or it can be maladaptive. So evolution does not only produce things that work well. Evolution produces things that get stuff and go wrong. And sometimes evolution You heard it in the back, but uh, why don't we take about a minute and discuss with a partner. What did you think of his lecture? Even if you couldn't hear it very well in the back, what did you think of his lecture technique from what you can see in the video portion? So discuss with a partner, the sitting person sitting next to you for about a minute or two. Okay. If critique this lecture in terms of the kind of criteria you see on your handout. Transitional expressions. Repetition. I think at first, the first thing you mentioned was intonation. intonation? Yes, intonation. His intonation. Okay, he had pretty. Was his voice? I know the volume, the audio quality wasn't good, but apart from that, did he have a, did he have a good voice? You didn't think so. Okay. Uh, she thought good intonation. What you didn't think so? Okay. So, uh, so, 
Okay. You didn't like his walking around? Okay. Okay, first let's talk about voice and intonation. Men tend to have low voices, and especially if you have a low voice, you may need to work on more intonation, especially men or people with low voices. So he has kind of a low voice, like, uh, like many guys. And to me, the voice sounds pretty strong, but probably more intonation would be helpful. So sometimes more intonation. When you are lecturing and you notice that the audience seems to start losing interest, maybe you need to increase your intonation a bit. Okay? Just increase your intonational range for a while. <clears throat> Especially if you have a low voice in general. Because low voices, the human ear is designed to hear voices at a higher pitch and kind of the medium or higher range. The human ear is designed more optimally for, the, for medium, especially higher vo uh, voice ranges. So people with low voices, that's great for singing, but for classroom lecturing, you need more intonation. You didn't like the walking around, a couple of you mentioned. Did anyone think that his walking around was okay? You thought it was okay? How many of you thought it was too much? It was annoying or distracting? Several of you. Partly this is a cultural difference, although I do agree that he, he is walking a little bit too much. But um, many Americans, Westerners in general, when we lecture, you notice how I move around, right? <laughs> and actually, I don't move around as much as he does, of course, hopefully. <laughs> My style is probably more moderate, which is common to in Western culture. In Korean culture, the professor sta stands in one place and lectures. It's boring, right? It helps to move around some, a little bit. It helps to move around moderately. Again, this is a cultural difference too, but at least, so you don't have to walk around like Steve Jobs who does it very well, <clears throat> but it helps to move a little bit to help interact with the audience. And so the audience won't get tired looking at you like a statue. You don't want to be a statue. If you look at Steve Jobs in his lectures, he's very much a master. Or Michael Sandel <clears throat> also. Mike, uh, Steve Jobs, for example, he'll start here on one side, and he'll kind of move around slowly towards the center and occasionally maybe to the other side of the stage a little bit but he'll spend much of his time walking around the center maybe occasionally going to one side of the stage or, or the other and that helps keep the audience engaged okay what are some other things you noticed about his talk Gestures? Okay. Let me uh, get a look at him. Okay. So he's, we, we don't have to play it, but just, let's just get some random points. Yeah, so he's kind of uh, holding, I think, a, it's, is he holding there? Oh, he's just gesturing with his hand. Okay. Oh, there is he. he is it a good idea to put your hand in the pocket like he, he is? <laughs> Like this? Do you want to do this in a lecture? Probably not, especially in uh, Korea. Uh, now, in, um, as an American, it's probably a bit more okay in American culture. Uh, in American culture, this might look kind of cool, but not too much. Uh, not too much. You know, the gesture. What else do you... Uh, so you like the gestures. Gestures are good for audience interaction. What else? We'll talk about body language more detail in a later. Uh, seminar, by the way. What are some other things you noticed? Did he have a good introduction? It was hard to hear at first, but were you able to tell if he had a good introduction? It was a bit more of a long introduction because I think it's probably the first day, maybe uh, at least of this section of the course. And he's introducing really uh, complicated stuff. He's talking about natural selection, which is a really big, important concept in, in biology and evolution. And so what he's having to do is kind of explain what it is and what it isn't. 
because there are misconceptions uh, out there that he has to deal with. So he has to explain briefly what it is and what it is not. And then he goes on to give a practical example. What practical example d does he give for evolution? Hmm? <clears throat> well, not so much research, but he actually gave a very practical example of evolution. A daily life example of evolution that happens in a very short time scale. <coughs> he talked about antibiotics and how bacteria quickly become resistant to antibiotics. And that's an example of evolution, specifically microevolution. <coughs> so he gave a practical real life example of evolution in our daily lives. Uh, and it's practical because, as he says, the the drug companies are in an arms race with these bacteria. They're trying to produce better antibiotics and the bacteria keep evolving and becoming resistant to antibiotics. So he had a very good, it was a very long detailed introduction. Uh, in this case he's introducing a complex topic. Did you hear any transition expressions? Okay, he's giving you an overview. It's going to be about rates of evolution, why evolution is sometimes very fast, sometimes very slow, and it's going to be about... Notice the repetition. It's going to be, it's going to be... He's laying out the kind of the points A, B, and C of his lecture, and he's using the term repetition, which is effective. So repetition is like a transitional device. It's going to be about A, it's going to be about B, it's going to be about C. Okay, he's introducing an outline. You can't see it, but it's up on a big PowerPoint above, up above. Basically, he said basically, that's a transitional expression. Notice he put stress on adaptive. It can be neutral. Neutral. So he said adaptive. So he puts he puts stress, special stress or emphasis, adaptive, neutral, maladaptive. He's drawing a kind of a comparison by putting kind of a contrastive stress uh, on those key words. And that's kind of a transitional device too. He is that uh, uh, basically what we call sentence stress. Uh, putting special emphasis on keywords. It's going to be uh, adaptive, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be neutral, blah, blah, blah. It's going to be maladaptive, blah, blah, blah. It's a transitional device. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let's move on to uh, more of a humanities style lecture. Uh, this thing will work. We're going to play the first couple minutes from Michael Sandel. You know Michael Sandel? Okay. It's very unusual for a philosophy professor in that he's actually a very interesting philosopher to listen to. All right, got an advertisement here. Uh, where's the volume? Okay, let me skip through the credits here. Uh, not many philosophers are, are actually interesting to listen to. Um, he's unusually telegenic for a philosopher. Uh, most philosophers that I've known are either strange or... Okay. Kind of. Return to the question of distributive justice. How should income and wealth and power and opportunities be distributed according to what principles? John Rawls offers a detailed answer to that question. And we're going to examine and assess his answer to that question today. We put ourselves in a position to do so last time by trying to make sense of why he thinks that principles of justice are best derived from a hypothetical contract. And what matters is that the hypothetical contract be carried out in an original position of equality behind 
behind what Rawls calls the veil of ignorance. So that much is clear. All right, then let's turn to the principles that Rawls says would be chosen behind the veil of ignorance. First, we consider some of the major alternatives. What about utilitarianism? Would the people in the original position choose to govern their collective lives? Utilitarian principles, the greatest goes to the greatest number. No. They wouldn't, Walt says. And the reason is that behind the veil of ignorance, everyone knows that once the veil goes up and real life begins, we will each want to be respected with dignity. Even if we turn out to be a member of a minority, we don't want to be oppressed. And so we would agree to reject utilitarianism and instead to adopt as our first principle equal basic liberties, fundamental rights to freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, religious liberty, freedom of conscience, and the like. We wouldn't want to take the chance that we would wind up as members of an oppressed or a despised minority with the majority tyrannizing over us. And so Rawls says utilitarianism would be rejected. Utilitarianism makes the mistake, Rawls writes, of forgetting, or at least not taking seriously the distinction between persons. And in the original position by the Veil of Ignorance, we would recognize that and reject utilitarianism. We wouldn't trade off our fundamental rights and liberties for any economic advantages. That's the first principle. First. Second principle has Second. to do the transition. with social and economic inequalities. What would we agree to? Okay. So you just heard first, second. That's a transitional expression for a second, such and such. Let me skip through later and we can see some of the interaction. We would love some. Of the, let's look at that point. What's your name? Kate. Kate, you suspect that the ability to get into top schools may largely depend on coming from an affluent family, having a favorable back family background, social, cultural, economic advantages, and so on. I mean, economic, but yes, social, cultural, all of those advantages, for sure. Someone did a study of the 146 selected colleges and universities in the United States. And they looked at the students in those colleges and universities to try to find out what their background was, their economic background. What percentage do you think come from the bottom quarter of the income scale. You know what the figure is? Only 3% of students at the most selective colleges and universities come from poor backgrounds. Over 70% come from affluent families. Okay, stop there. <clears throat> Do you like his lecture style? Do you like him as a lecturer? Okay. When I was in college, I thought about doing a minor in philosophy. And I tried a couple of philosophy classes, and my philosophy pre professors were extremely strange creatures. And I decided not to do that. Uh, he's actually more like a human being, uh, unlike my philosophy professors in college. Uh, he's actually interesting to listen to, and he seems like a normal, mentally well-adjusted person, unlike some others I had. Uh, what do you think of his lecture? What are some specific things that you notice? Maybe specific strong points? And there could be a couple of 
Weak points, too. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, he pauses at strategic points before uh, maybe key words. As you're say, saying a sentence, for example, usually the key words are kind of at the end or near the end of a sentence. So oftentimes good lecturers will kind of pause in the middle before they get to kind of the main point of a sentence. It may be a noun or a phrase a after the verb of the sentence, oftentimes and such. So he uses pauses effectively. What else does he do? Okay. In, in what way does he speak like a candidate? Okay, so she says that he talks like a candidate. Uh, in other words, maybe polished. His delivery maybe is very polished, very um, effective. Mm -hmm. What are some specific things that might make his delivery effective or his teaching effective? Okay. Yes, yeah. questions, yes. Thoughtful questions, questions that get students to think. Uh, before the second part, he was actually, actually asking questions about the fairness. Is it fair that um, the top schools like Harvard, he's at Harvard, usually the, the students from Harvard come from really good backgrounds, rich parents and such. Is, he's asking questions about the fairness of this kind of situation. And he asked students a question specifically well, what percentage of Harvard students do you think came from really good families, families with money? And the statistics are actually quite interesting. <clears throat> what are some other things that make his delivery, his teaching effective? Was his movement effective, the way he moved around? Do you find it distracting or do you think it's, it's helpful? It was helpful, okay. So he moves around very calmly. Notice he moved around kind of slowly, okay. He's not moving around like this. Sometimes new teachers move around like this, kind of nervous. It's, you don't want to move around nervously like you've had too, way too much coffee. Okay. <laughs> By the way, something you will see maybe in America, if you attend lectures in American universities, even in a big classroom, when a teacher is lecturing, especially younger professors, they might actually move into the audience like this. Now this might be, would it be shocking and or kind of, is it strange if I move this close to you? Right. Uh, it's maybe strange in Korean culture, but some American or Western professors will do that. Why would they do that? It seems to violate your sense of boundary, your, your sense of space, right? Like I'm violating your personal space, right? <laughs> Why would professors do this? Want to hear from students? Maybe want to hear from students. What about people in the back? When you get students in the back to pay attention, often students who sit in the back may be less attentive, and I can even write, move right into the camera. One TV <laughs> comedian actually experimented with moving right into the camera. Uh, he, he, did it very uh, effectively to kind of make fun of uh, the space uh, boundaries. Usually think of a spatial boundary between you and the professor and younger, uh, more modern professors in Western countries, especially North America, will violate it. Uh, for example, studies show in a classroom, usually the students who sit in the back half or more tend to be the students who don't do as well they may be not paying attention as much. They might be texting or, or such. And so it's a way of interacting with students in the back if you're teaching a class. Now in Korea, this might not work if you're a Kangsa or if you're a young professor. But if you go abroad, professors in Australia or the US or Canada might do that. What are some other things about Professor Sandel's lecture that you thought were effective or maybe you thought was not quite effective? The way he rephrases like the students answer, okay. 
Okay, so we asked students questions, got them to reply. He paraphrased the questions. And why would he paraphrase that? Mm, so that others understand clearly yes. what she said. Yeah, so, so, so that other people can hear and understand as well as the fact that he's going to comment on it. And he's going to incorporate that into his, line of, his own line of thought. What else do you notice about his, his lecture style, his technique? Okay. Just uh, eye contact. Eye contact, yes. Yes. And even though it's a big class, and if you could, when you, when you pan out, you can see it's a class of hundreds of students. Yet he does make eye contact with the students. And what kind of gestures does he make? Okay. Just. Hmm? Okay, crossing his, I, I did notice that too, he was crossing his arms at one point. Now, is this a good idea? No? So he doesn't do everything, yeah, this is, so he's usually, usually good, but this is maybe one thing that's a distraction. Is it, why is it not good to cross your arms? Yes. In terms of the psychology of body language and gestures, this is a defensive gesture. So it can, it can be defensive, which in turn can convey different things, or it might be done for different reasons. Most often, a person might do it just because this is comfortable. <laughs> but to an audience, it might be perceived as defensive, or um, maybe uh, sort of it could be arrogant. He's a professor from Harvard. He can afford to be <laughs> arrogant if he wants to, but he's not. Uh, he's not an arrogant professor. It might seem defensive. Uh, people do it sometimes because they're nervous, so it might convey nervousness. So it's not good so much to do uh, defensive gestures because they will convey nervousness, lack of confidence. Uh, in that case, he, I assume he's probably doing it for comfort's sake, but it's not a great technique. Let's just kind of look through and. I'm not going to play any audio, it's just uh, uh, kind of an emphasis gesture, I guess. Okay. So you see his eye contact. He seems pretty relaxed. Oh, hand in the pocket again. <coughs> this is more American style. If you do that, well, in American culture, you could do this occasionally, but not too much. And this could seem cool, but he's got his arm kind of right there, kind of ready to make gestures and such. Okay, I pointed out a couple of transitionals. Anything else that you notice? <coughs> How is his voice? Do you think he has a good speaking voice? Is it better than the biology professor we just heard? Yes. Okay. This is maybe a hard thing for new teachers. How do you use your voice? Sometimes when you're a new teacher, you can actually strain your voice. Especially if you're, if you speak, if you're going to be teaching English. And doing this in a second language takes more energy. It takes more effort and it's really tiring. But also for English, English has more intonation. The intonation of English is complicated compared to Korean. Korean is kind of monotonal. So much, but for English, you need more intonation. That takes more energy, therefore more of a possibility of <coughs> taxing or straining your voice muscles. Uh, even with a microphone, is a microphone the magic answer to a weak voice? No? Why not? It could be flat or... Uh huh. Right. The, the noise and even the microphone won't compensate for a weak voice. I once had a professor in graduate school, a statistics professor, who had a weak voice. She was a very small lady, and I guess she didn't really have lungs. I don't know. She had a very tiny, weak voice, and we complained that we couldn't hear her. So the department put her into a bigger room with a microphone. 
<coughs> but the microphone was kind of like a necklace style microphone. It was hung around her neck and it was down here. And we still couldn't hear her with the microphone. So her voice was so weak. A mic can't necessarily compensate for a weak voice. And you're going to end up hurting your voice too if you don't use your voice right. <coughs> if you're a new teacher, you have to use these muscles here. If you just use the throat muscles, you're going to hurt your voice. Especially if you're teaching a lot. So you have to use the muscles here. And this is something I've had to learn from years of teaching, and especially last year when I had health problems. I had to learn to use this more. <coughs> and especially in days like today when I'm talking a lot. Do you know what this muscle here is called? There's a muscle down here under the lungs. It's called the diaphragm muscle. So I think you could tell people like Michael Sandel, Steve Jobs, probably Barack Obama, pe people who are good speakers use the diaphragm to project their voice. So it's basically learning to, you, basically you tense your stomach muscles and that in turn tenses the diaphragm. The diaphragm is this muscle right here under the lungs. So tensing the stomach muscles tenses the diaphragm and the diaphragm then pushes the lungs and it allows you to push air out of the lungs better. So you need to practice tensing your muscles here while talking, which is hard to do consciously. It takes a lot of work and training and effort. <clears throat> but I've had to simply because health problems last year really hurt my throat, my voice. Uh, so I had to learn uh, really to do this myself. <clears throat> And even now my voice is going because I just gave a, a tip gong a couple of hours before this. Uh, but I'm able to talk. Now if I weren't using my diaphragm, by now I would be without any voice. Uh, but by learning the diaphragm, you can learn to project your voice better, project to the back of the room. <coughs> and I might even be able to talk without a microphone to the back of the room uh, if I had to, which I couldn't have done earlier. <coughs> And you can also go through and probably find some other transitional expressions and such. I'll just do maybe a quick sample here. But, oops. The Lacanian principle is the greatest root to the greatest number. No. The root of all sense. Notice his intonation. The is that behind the veil of ignorance, everyone knows. Like the reason is that that's a once transitional. The veil goes up. One. And real life begins. Can we go forward? Even if we're not allowed to Even if we're emphasis. He's using gestures for emphasis. We can do better if we can to a qualified principle of equality. Ross calls it the difference principle. A principle. Let me just skip on. Let me put it in there at this. Fair enough. Let me change. What would you say? Go ahead. Fair enough. My question is if the merit-based argument is based on um, when everyone is at a level of equality. Go on, short. It begins. One last thing. What about use of media? Did you use PowerPoint? Is there any PowerPoint here? No. Do you need to use PowerPoint? Not every time. He never uses PowerPoint, as far as I can tell. I don't think he ever uses PowerPoint. Is it still effective? Sure. <clears throat> Do you think some visual aids would help his lecture? Did he have the bar graph? Okay, he had a bar graph. He had one bar graph. That's all you need. What about Steve Jobs? Does Steve Jobs use a lot of, well, Obviously, does Steve Jobs use PowerPoint? Did he use PowerPoint? No, because PowerPoint is from Microsoft, and that's the enemy. <laughs> that's his enemy. He uses Keynote. Keynote is the Apple presentation software, which I'm told is really much better than PowerPoint. I never use PowerPoint. Sometimes I use Prezi. The first uh, seminar I did, the first day was Prezi. I'll show you Prezi later on, which is kind of more cool. But I never use PowerPoint. I find it distracting. I might use it very, maybe every few years if I have to, or if I'm doing a conference presentation. In fact, I only use PowerPoint if I do a conference presentation because it's expected at conferences. 
but otherwise I don't find it useful. I prefer to talk to people. I prefer to use handouts or maybe Prezi. There are other ways of using visual aids. <clears throat> so there's a problem sometimes of relying too much on PowerPoint. Now I know sometimes in say some fields you have a lot of information, you have a lot of data, you have a lot of graphs like medicine, biomedical fields, biology where you do have to use a lot of PowerPoint but as much as possible don't rely too much on PowerPoint or if you are using PowerPoint don't let the PowerPoint control the lecture you know, talk to the students, don't talk to the screen you know, <laughs> uh, talk to the students, interact move around, ask questions, get the students to look at you and not the PowerPoint. Make sure that you're the teacher, not the PowerPoint, if you are using PowerPoint. <clears throat> it's really important that they have a human teacher, not a PowerPoint teacher. <clears throat> and uh, frankly, I've never had really any trouble teaching without PowerPoint. I've been quite fine not using PowerPoint. I've always found it kind of troublesome to want to prepare. It takes time to prepare PowerPoint. And then secondly, I don't like the fact that the screen takes up my whiteboard. I like to use whiteboard. And this screen, it's better here than in other classrooms actually, but in some classrooms I have no whiteboard space because of, because of the screen. And I don't like that. I like to use the whiteboard. Um, so, you don't necessarily have to be a PowerPoint dominated lecture. There's kind of a joke I heard back when uh, this school started requiring professors to, to teach in English. And there was a term I heard from some of my friends who teach um, the, the freshman academic English courses. They told me about this term called next professor. Do you know what a next professor is? It's a professor who really maybe has trouble teaching or teaching in English. So he simply reads aloud a PowerPoint slide, goes next, and reads aloud the slot, reads it aloud, word for word, next. That's not very interesting, is it? Okay. We'll talk more about principles of using PowerPoint, if you do use PowerPoint or other visual aids, in a later seminar. Next week we're going to talk more about pronunciation, especially if you are doing public speaking or lecturing. We'll talk about pronunciation and fluency. So that's it for today. So enjoy the nice February weather outside. And even though it's April, the weather is February. Nice, nice uh, Siberian weather, Mongolian weather, maybe Canadian weather. Anyway, enjoy. Have a good weekend. See you next week. <laughs>